This is Elizabeth Melton. I'm the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Luce Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We are meeting in the Fetzer Institute boardroom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Friday, June 2nd, 2023, and I am joined by Brian Smith. Brian, could you introduce yourself? I'm Reverend Brian E. Smith, Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Chicago Theological Seminary, and I pastor in the northern suburbs of the Chicagoland area. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, could you tell me just a little bit about um, your, your project that you are a part of? We were approached by Luce uh, in 2020 with the Emergency Response Grant, and the idea was to provide support to practitioners serving uh, primarily on the south and west sides of Chicago where we had major challenges. Uh, not only did we have the pandemic, but there was the unrest following the uh, debacle with the George Floyd murder. And so residents were hurting and the entire south side of Chicago was impacted. I think we had every single commercial outlet actually destroyed or looted during that time. And this was a precarious moment for faith leaders. And so we were able to convene 50 faith leaders at this moment to actually look at ways that we could help improve their communities and give them the opportunity to do better work on the south and west sides of Chicago. After convening these faith leaders, we actually provided uh, several uh, support services in response to uh, what we heard. We actually had one of our professors, uh, Dr. Zach Moon, to bring together eight professors to talk about doing pandemic, uh, doing um, uh, ministry in a pandemic circumstance. And then we were able to do support services in the form of counseling and group therapy for faith leaders. Uh, and then we actually provided grants to 30 congregations helping them to develop their technology response during COVID. That's amazing. Um, I love getting to hear a little bit about um, those, those communities that you're able to serve. Are there um, specific stories that come to mind that, that your grantees shared back with you from what they were able to do? I receive responses still on a daily basis uh, because we've continued the work and I've continued to uh, work with these uh, respondents. And we actually have a group now called the Black Faith Leader Collective that emerged from our early work. I've heard terms like, uh, you've been a lifesaver, you've been a support. Uh, one of my constituents actually referred to me as his pastor. And so that, that's a great compliment when you're talking about imams, uh, pastors, and rabbis who are a part of our constituency. Um, this was a precarious time for all of us, and we were responding to the pressures that came to us immediately. And the greatest challenge was to try to make sense of what was happening, if you could do that in a pandemic season, but also to be effective in terms of how we deal with those challenges. So one of the greatest challenges that our, our constituents constituencies uh, encountered was the isolation from their congregants as well as the surrounding community. We didn't have a vaccine and at the time we had to figure out how we continue to do ministry, how we continue to maintain our sanity as we were doing um, not only ministry but education and all sorts of things from our households. And it was an exciting journey for me as a pastor, because not only did I have 50 plus faith leaders to, to serve, but I had my own congregation to serve. And um, when you talk about the stories that people tell when we talk about it now, uh, again, I think um, one of the, the most telling terms was uh, when someone referred to me as a lifesaver. Of course, I don't consider myself that. I, I consider myself uh, an instrument, a tool, uh, that was used in the process, but certainly I was there to stand in the gap, and I continued to do so, and I, I'm still present with many of those faith leaders to this day. 
That's wonderful. Um, can you tell me about a moment when you were surprised during the course of your project? I know that it was a time of, of a lot of shifting and making do, you know, a situation in the pandemic that none of us knew fully what to expect. But so what were some of those surprises and how were y'all able to respond? Well, I, I think um, because of how we structured our project, it was interfaith from the start. We prioritized women. We prioritized members from the LGBTQ community. And we looked for pastors and faith leaders uh, from smaller congregations, those that really needed the resources. And it was not, I, I, I guess I wouldn't call it a surprise as much as I would call it a, a, a cathartic moment to see how we all came together and because we were together, we realized we had a similar mission. And we were on one accord, despite having this diversity uh, that usually uh, causes divisiveness. But I think it brought us together because we began to pray together. Uh, we would have Muslim, Christian, and Jewish prayers at all of our gatherings. Uh, we began to talk about our faith in terms of uh, what it means to, to, to address the ills of society but how we could transcend that and become one body. Uh, one opportunity that came as a result of the demographics was the fact that we were all primarily black, although there were others who were serving in black communities that wanted to support us. So there was this beautiful coalition that came together at a time when we were looking at divisiveness, when we were looking at how racism was tearing our country apart. And even after the funding ended, the constituents came to me and said, we don't want our work to end. And that was a wonderful surprise. And, and uh, we formed this group called the Black Faith Leader Collective. And we've continued to have modules, listening sessions, networking opportunities. And um, we actually evolved from just supporting the uh, efforts to do virtual worship and mental health to actually doing vaccine education and vaccination clinics on site. And so I was able to partner with a couple of organizations, Interfaith America and the uh, City of Chicago Department of Health. And I would say we vaccinated well over 1,500 people through our partnerships. And I, I appreciate the role, but I have to be careful about the fact that I have uh, carried uh, literally 50 congregations with me. This retreat has been amazing to help me to really step back and process that and to look at what it means to serve, but also to be a whole person to continue to do service. Yeah, that's, when you think about, you know, working with, with 50 pastors, ministers, you know, faith leaders, and then each of their congregations, who they represent, right? You can see how, how big of an impact yes. um, this had and how, how many communities you were able to kind of um, to reach through this. Um, and thinking about, so as the work continues and as you move forward, um, you've spoken a little bit about what that looks like, but have have you've been able to meet in person more? Are there different ways of getting together um, or what you kind of hope this will continue to look like down the line? Um, yes, we have been able to meet in person. In fact, we've developed multiple groups from the initial gathering. We actually have a small cohort of uh, about 10 of those faith leaders that are a part of a partnership called the Oikos Group. And Oikos is an organization that helps faith leaders to begin to redefine their mission and to pursue concrete efforts to improve their respective communities. And so we've done that now, uh, well, we're coming into the second year of that, where we've held education modules, uh, helping them to, to reclaim and reframe their mission as faith institutions. And now we're pivoting to be able to help some of them with pre-development financing to do concrete projects specifically on their physical plans. 
um, and we've been able to visit them uh, and, and be present with them during those moments. And a, a, a striking moment was when I looked at this vast array of uh, technology equipment at one of the congregations that, that, that's a part of our cohort. And the pastor said, thank you, Brian, because with your work, we were able to leverage the initial funding that you gave us to build this whole technology center for our congregation. And so now we're looking at trying to help them to refurbish and redevelop their existing property for greater uh, works and ministry. That's amazing. Um, so I'm kind of picking up that that's maybe one of example of some of these kind of concrete um, goals that these these communities have. What are some of the other like goals that these communities have? What are the things that they want to look forward to? We are discovering that during the pandemic there was a great deal of wear and tear. Even though we are still here and we're still present, we know now that many of our faith leaders need even more support. I have personally journeyed with five members of my cohort that have become seriously ill. One of which received a heart transplant because of a massive heart attack. So I am engaging in wellness uh, activities with the cohort at this point. We had to uh, limit the work because I was concerned that so many members were becoming sick. So I launched a wellness initiative three months ago. We hired a consultant just to meet with faith leaders to tell them, hey, we know that you're working hard to serve the community, but you have to serve yourself. And I am hoping to launch uh, t two things that I would like to do. I want to launch a wellness initiative to help clergy to continue to care for themselves physically, mentally, spiritually. And then also, I want to continue to work with Oikos to help provide technical assistance to congregations as they retool and reimagine what they can be for their communities. So when you talk about the present day, I think that's where we're at, looking at personal wellness and um, um, mission alignment. Thank you so much for sharing that. I feel like that is something that that's maybe getting overlooked a bit. And now that we're moving out of this time of the immediate needs of the pandemic, what is that long, long service of care that we need moving forward, right? Um, I think that's really interesting. So as someone who's kind of navigated all of these networks, um, dealt with this moment of kind of urgent crisis, learned all of these lessons, developed all these relationships. What advice would you have for other um, scholars, theologians, uh, folks that, that would want to do this type of community engaged work? Um, what advice would you have for them? Number one, acknowledge that we have entered a new age. There's no going back. Um, the pandemic presented permanent changes and we must be sensitive to the fact that these alterations have occurred. Secondly, we have the capacity to become new people. Our institutions can become something different. Maybe it's not something that we imagine, but it is something that we can, we, we can reimagine. Um, and I think that we need to reevaluate our mission. And, and I'm speaking, well, no, all institutions, uh, not just faith institutions. I think everyone must take the opportunity to retool and ask themselves, why? Why am I here? What is my unique role? Because now I have an opportunity to reimagine because of this shift whether you're a, a business entity, a government entity, a faith entity, in light of COVID, you need to reimagine who you are because your constituents are going through the same challenge. We need to reestablish trust. I think during this period, because of the separation 
and because of uh, some inequity, inequities that have been exposed. I think the public uh, seeks more accountability from people who have been designated as uh, um, um, leadership. Uh, and we've seen this in government. We've seen things that we have never seen at the highest levels of government. And so we should use this time as, as an opportunity to regain trust and reevaluate our relationships, uh, both externally and internally, and then chart a path going forward. Thank you. Um, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I'd like to ask you, you know, thinking of this as, as an archival moment, right, as something that will, these stories will be saved for, for future generations, future scholars, um, what, what would you want them to, to really take away from this project? What is the thing you'd like to leave them with when thinking about the work that you were able to do? I have faith in the good of humanity. I realized when I was pressed individually and when others collectively were pressed uh, during tumultuous times that we have the capacity to do good. Yes, we went through some terrible times. There was a lot of death and there was a lot of destruction, but we're still here. And we made the decision in faith to be present for our communities and present for each other. We have the capacity to be good towards each other. If we could harness that capacity in times where we have more comfort with just now as we exit the, 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 the worst of the pandemic season, if we could invest more time in doing good, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, what kind of world would we have? And I, I just, I would encourage people to, to seek the flourishing of uh, uh, your neighbor and yourself. That's what I'm doing here today. For, for the first time in a long time, I'm actually looking at me and I'm saying, okay, Brian, you're a human being, you went through a great deal. What are you doing now to refresh and, and, and renew? Because you have the capacity to do good towards yourself as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think with that, we will end our interview.